All right, formally, good afternoon, everybody. Um, <laughs> good afternoon for uh, everyone that joined us over Zoom. It's great to see uh, Jeff and Melanie with us. So it's a great day for uh, the lab and particularly for uh, Chris Neeters that is pre presenting his exit seminar. So Chris joined the lab uh, exactly two years ago and uh, that's an amazing time to bring this up to a conclusion because uh, Chris had accomplished quite a lot, not only uh, concerning what he's presenting today, uh, but also concerning all the building, all the waiting that he went over with grace, uh, waiting, you know, all of the lighting systems to be installed. So uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, let Chris uh, present his study in identifying optimal hydroponic nutrient solution management strategies in CEA. Chris, the floor is yours, so you have uh, approximately 45 minutes. So enlighten us with everything you've done in the last you know, two years. All right, perfect. Thanks, Renato. I'll do the best I can. Um, so yeah, as Renato uh, mentioned, I'm going to be talking about managing uh, hydroponic nutrient solutions in CEA. And just to start, CEA can be kind of a broad category. Like a lot of times it can be referred to like um, using high tunnels and stuff like that. But in the case of my presentation, when I'm talking about CEA, I'm only referring specifically to greenhouse and vertical farm production. Oh, no, just click on the screen. Oh, sure. Okay, there we go. All right, keep talking. So as I mentioned in CEA, this is becoming a more and more popular method of producing crops. Um, as it stands, the majority of our leafy grains such as lettuce and spinach are grown in Arizona and California. And kind of the movement towards more CEA production is where we can locate these farms near large distribution and urban centers. Um, these methods also use techniques that are recirculating. So instead of while you're um, directly applying your nutrient solution, in some systems, it can be drained to waste, where you apply the solution and then it drains just through the drain. But there's a lot of resource efficiency to be gained by recirculating your, um, your nutrient solutions. Um, unfortunately, there is challenges associated with using um, this technique. Uh, many of us know that you can start out with like a perfect formulation for your particular crop, or you have specific levels of each nutrient that are ideal for the given crop. But over time, a lot of the nutrients can be taken up at very different rates. So for example, elements like um, ammoniacal nitrogen can be taken up thousands of times faster than some other elements. So over time, that can become depleted while others can start to accumulate in your solution. So over time, this can lead to things like antagonisms in your solution where nutrients are less available. And if it's really severe, it can uh, lead to deficiencies and reduced growth. So many of you may be familiar with um, the Hoagland solution. This is really commonly used in research. The authors of that paper actually recommend that you drain and refill your reservoir on a weekly basis in order to counter this um, imbalance of nutrients. While this is an effective method for making sure that your solution has ideal composition of all the nutrients, there are some drawbacks. And within industry, draining and refilling is still a, a fairly common practice. Um, the majority of growers based on the CEA census of 2021 they're utilizing a reservoir flush in order to balance their solutions. And of that, a quarter of them are doing it on a monthly or more frequent basis. And as I said, this is an effective method to ensure that you have ideal compositions. Um, there are some drawbacks to using uh, this particular uh, strategy. Uh, the main one being eutrophication. As you're draining these solutions, they're still relatively rich in elements like phosphorus and nitrogen. And these can fuel algae blooms and lead to uh, subsequent eutrophication. Um, also, it's just not an economical way to manage your solution because over time you're simply just dumping valuable inputs to your farm down the drain. So we want to investigate other strategies that are out there that enable us to maintain our composition over time and not have these negative impacts on ecosystems as well as um, wasted costs for the growers. So currently there, as I mentioned, there are different strategies you can use beyond draining and refilling in order to balance your solution. But currently there's a gap in the literature that looks at comparing these different strategies and assesses how efficient they are in terms of their fertilizer use. Um, there's also a lack of data that is looking into comparing these different nutrient management strategies and how they impact things like your yield and your quality. 
Um, another gap in the research is how these different strategies may be impacted by light intensity. So for vertical farms, for example, a lot of different producers are growing under a wide array of light intensity. Uh, some companies are utilizing, they call an energy um, intensification strategy where they're growing at levels upwards of, you know, 800 ppm heat. Um, while others, it's a little bit, they have limitations on their power and their luminaires they're using, so they're growing under lower light levels. But as we know, light levels impact plant growth and these nutrient kinetics. So we also want to explore this knowledge gap and see how light and, um, is impacting the nutrient management strategies. And to tie onto that, also in the greenhouse, depending on the time of year you're growing, you're also limited on how much light you're getting from sunlight. So we want to investigate how this um, impact of light intensity impacts both of those production systems. And then also kind of to add on that another level, there's also a lack of data that's investigating how these different strategies might be impacted by the production system. So we wanted to compare how these different strategies would compare um, if we're producing in a vertical farm or a greenhouse, because there's some kind of inherent differences on these production methods. So we wanted to investigate uh, this is another one of our factors. So each of these knowledge gaps will serve as the objectives that I hope to um, reach through my research that I'll be presenting today. So as we set out to establish these different nutrient management strategies, we wanted to have a diverse set of strategies that differed both in their complexity um, as well as like their cost and ease of implementation. Um, so to begin with, our first strategy was just a simple drain and refill. So on a weekly basis, we would simply drain the solution and fill it up with um, our pre-made uh, starter solution in order to ensure that the nutrients were at the levels that we had wanted them to. So now as we go through the remainder of these strategies, they kind of go from non-targeted, easy to implement strategies to highly targeted, more complicated uh, strategies. So, and also for the remainder of the treatments, we were not draining and refilling, we we're simply replenishing any solution that was lost due to transpiration and filling it up to um, a predetermined level. So for the second treatment, we we're simply topping it off with full strength solution. Next, we we're filling up with a half strength solution um, by volume. So the thinking here is if you're applying a half strength solution for your refill, some of these elements that are slow to be taken up they will be accumulating less in solution while you're still replenishing some of those nutrients that are faster to be taken up. Um, our next strategy is an EC-based target. So we're using the electrical connectivity of the solution as a target to uh, maintain the nutrient level. This one is the most common one I've seen in production systems because it's semi-targeted. You have an idea of how much nutrients are in solution. Um, so like I said, that's the one I see most commonly used. Next, we're using a water use efficiency strategy. I'll cover the details a little bit more on the following slide, but this is essentially looking at how much water the plant's transpiring in its growth rate and determining an appropriate strength of solution based on how much it's growing and transpiring. And then finally, our last uh, strategy is to use individual nutrient dosing. So a lot of the literature out there now is looking at individual ion sensing probes that are able to detect which particular elements are being depleted, and then you can supplement those back at a particular rate. So that's our most advanced nutrient strategy. So any nutrients that are taken up, we've replenished those with um, the given fertilizer. And just to give a little bit more detail on the water use efficiency strategy, as I mentioned, we're looking at the weekly um, change in dry canopy biomass divided by um, the amount of water transpired. And then we're multiplying that by each individual element target for a leafy green crop and hydroponics. And then from that, you can get an appropriate strength of refill. So if the plant's growing a lot, producing a lot of biomass, um, we'll have a higher strength solution, essentially, that we'll provide. And as I said, we wanted to investigate different lighting treatments. So here is kind of an illustration of our vertical farm setup. We wanted to test three different light intensities. Uh, unfortunately, due to limitations in power, which is usually what it comes down to with lighting experiments, we were only able to achieve 700 ppfd uh, reliably. So that's why you kind of don't see the even spacing between our lighting treatments. And then one other thing I'll note while we're looking at this illustration of the vertical farm, each of those racks had a, a convection tube of plastic over it that was providing airflow. So you got more consistent airflow across all these different racks. Uh, and then as far as they ran on the same um, photo period length and they had all identical spectral distribution, uh, as you can see here on the table on the left. And then, as I mentioned, we wanted to explore how these strategies would be performing at a greenhouse as well. So we set up an identical 
lighting setup in the greenhouse where each bench had a, a distinct light level. Um, we're also, in the case of the greenhouse, obviously we're dealing with sunlight. So in order to kind of maintain more stable light intensities, we're using shade cloth. And then at the center of each bench, we had a quantum sensor installed and had it tied into a data logger that would dim the light. So when we got a lot of sunlight, that particular treatment would dim, so it would maintain a steady light level uh, through the duration of the day. Uh, the only thing that was slightly different as we were looking at greenhouse lighting was obviously the spectrum since we're dealing with sunlight. So if we look at the plot here on the left, this is what the spectral distribution of the supplemental lighting was, which is pretty typical for LED lighting. But as you can see in the panel on the left, as we get more uh, contribution from sunlight, the low light intensity level had to dim the LEDs more, and that's why you kind of see that more broad spectral distribution, which is more what you'd expect from uh, sunlight. So with these uh, six nutrient management strategies and three light intensity levels, we designed them into three by six factorial design into a split plot RCBD. Each of our experimental units was one deep water culture tray, as you can see here in the center. Uh, with four plants. We also wanted to test two different um, crop types. So we selected a lettuce cultivar and a spinach cultivar. At the beginning of each experiment, all of the deep water culture trays started with the same um, starter solution and the uh, PPM of each of the nutrients is shown here in the table below. And then pH for all of the tubs was maintained at uh, 5.8 through the duration of the experiment. Uh, so for data collection, we did a lot of painstaking work to maintain the pH, uh, characterize the solution. We also quantify, you know, biomass morphology. We did some um, pigment composition and some gas exchange and fluorescence at the end of the experiment. And I'll share some of this data with you in some of the later slides. So as I mentioned earlier, there are some kind of distinct features of growing in a greenhouse versus vertical farm. So as we can see here, these are kind of some ambient conditions that we were tracking in both of the locations. Uh, the two to note that are more different are the CO2 concentration and VPD. So oftentimes growers in a vertical farm will enhance the ambient air with CO2 concentration in order to enhance photosynthetic rates and increase growth. Uh, whereas in the greenhouse, especially in southern states, it's less practical to apply CO2 as you have high ventilation needs. Um, but kind of tied into that, as we're looking at the VPD, we were growing these crops in the greenhouse in the winter months, so the air tends to be drier. And we're also utilizing heaters, so that dries out the air a little bit more. So there were some differences also in the VPD uh, between the two experiments. So that's something to kind of keep, keep in mind as we go through the, to the results. Okay, so chapter one will focus on the lettuce results. So here on our y-axis, we have the uh, fresh biomass per plant. Um, as we look at the greenhouse trial, we can see that for the above ground biomass, we saw significant differences in yield for every increase in light intensity. And we saw that same trend hold true in the root biomass. As we look at the vertical farm data, we see a similar trend, but in the case of the 500 PPFD treatment, we actually saw a significantly higher yield compared to the 500 grown in the greenhouse. Um, and actually we saw across the board, we saw less in general root biomass accumulation in the vertical farm. Kind of an exciting result though, is as we went to compare um, how the lettuce performed under the different nutrient management strategies, we actually saw that there were no significant differences in yield as we went to compare the nutrient management strategies. And we didn't see an interaction effect between the strategies and the light intensity. So this was actually an exciting result because as we looked at through the duration of the trial, we were tracking fertilizer use. And you can see here that as we're comparing across the nutrient management strategies, Simply by avoiding draining and refilling, obviously we're saving a lot of fertilizer. So on average, we're using about 90% less fertilizer just by using these strategies. And even in the case of like using the lab-based strategy, we're using 99% less fertilizer. So that's, that's a huge reduction, obviously. Um, as we move on, just compare between the strategies that are not draining and refilling, we actually saw some pretty stark differences as well. As I mentioned, using the EC-based control is one of the most commonly used methods in a lot of production systems. And it was actually one of the strategies that used the most fertilizer, as we can see here. And if we compare that to some of the other strategies, we're even able to use 95% less than the EC-based strategy using some of these other techniques. So that was an exciting result. Um, as I mentioned, we also took a lot of work to manage the pH through the duration of the experiment. And one thing that I had noticed was the treatment that was the drain and refill, we were constantly having to adjust pH so especially if you look at the vertical farm, 
on our y-axis here, this is the sum of the pH am amendments that we added through the duration of the trial. And you can see that we use a lot more. And I think a lot of that is to do with, as we're draining um, the trays on a weekly basis, it's kind of altering the buffering capacity of the solution. Because as these tubs are in a vertical farm specifically, they're absorbing CO2, forming carbonic acid, which will acidify. So as we're dumping that out and replenishing it with a fresh new solution, I think it kind of has to reestablish that, um, that kind of equilibrium in solution. So that was another challenge that I didn't expect to see with rain and refill. Um, but you can also see that happen somewhat in the, um, in the greenhouse trials as well. So I mentioned we also wanted to look at how these strategies impacted uh, tiferent chlorosis. Here we're looking at how the light levels impacted um, chlorosis and tip burn. Uh, we see this is kind of a not surprising finding. As light levels increase, you're increasing growth rate, which is generally associated with higher prevalence of tip burn. Um, and then at the higher light levels, we saw more chlorosis. Nothing that looks specific to like a particular nutrient deficiency, but more associated with like a light stress. Um, but another cool finding was as we compared the rates of uh, dip burn and chlorosis, we didn't see a significant difference um, as we compared through the nutrient management strategies. And again, we didn't see any interaction effect between light intensity and nutrient management strategy. Uh, we also looked at leaf pigmentation. Again, we saw differences in light level, but as we compared between the nutrient management strategies, we also saw that there wasn't a difference in chlorophyll content or anthocyanin content. Um, quantified by handheld uh, devices. So this was like a content index. Um, at the end of the experiment, we also quantified how much of each um, particular element was left in solution. So on our x-axis here, we have all of our individual elements that we quantified, and then each of the rows is a nutrient management strategy. So the very top row is our initial, and the color scaling here is representative of if there was a depletion, it will go more blue. And if it's red, it's an accumulation. And one thing to note here is as we look at these strategies that tended to use more fertilizer, they also tended to accumulate more of these elements in solution at the end of the experiment. And we saw this trend was true as we compared at the different light levels as well. And one thing to note as well, as we grew the plants under higher light intensities, they also tended to deplete um, elements faster. And that was kind of across the board that you can't necessarily easily see here. Um, as we look at the vertical farm results, we saw a similar trend where EC and full strength refill techniques ended up accumulating more of the nutrients in solution over time. Uh, we also quantified the nutrient levels in the tissue at the end of the experiment. So here we're looking at the greenhouse grown lettuce. You can see that for the majority of the elements, they are, so on our X axis here, we have our different nutrient management strategies and within those is the PPFD levels. And then the green zone is the recommended sufficiency zone for hydroponic leafy greens. We can see that the majority of the elements are within or above um, that sufficiency zone, but we can see that calcium and magnesium were low um, across all the nutrient management strategies and light intensity levels. As we look at the micro elements, we saw similar trends where the majority of them are within that sufficiency range. But in the case of um, iron and zinc, we actually had higher amounts. And in some cases, these were impacted by a uh, light intensity level. Um, so now these are the results for the vertical farm. Uh, we saw a similar trend as we saw in the greenhouse where calcium and magnesium were low while the other elements were at or within that sufficiency range. We did tend to see elements like um, phosphorus and potassium higher than that range, as well as things like zinc and iron, um, which tended to be higher in the tissue than what was recommended for the sufficiency range. So as we looked at the results of the tissue and the nutrient solution data, we we're curious at how the levels of, or the concentration of elements in solution were impacting the levels in the tissue. So here we have a Pearson correlation plot so we're comparing to see if there's a linear relationship between the tissue concentration and the solution. So if we kind of focus in on this box here, we can see that for the majority of the elements, there's not a significant relationship between the concentration of, of that particular element and solution and what is in the tissue itself. Um, in the cases of things like nitrogen, we can see that higher amounts of nitrate and ammonium are correlated higher with the tissue amount. But for some elements like calcium, which we saw was kind of low in our tissue results, 
there was actually seemed to be antagonistic results where um, higher amounts of these elements in solution were actually causing less calcium in the tissue, which is nothing new. It's well known that a lot of these cations can have antagonistic effects on each other. So it's just kind of another note to say, maintaining high concentrations of fertilizer throughout the duration of the experiment can have detrimental results and it doesn't necessarily correlate with higher amounts in your tissue. Uh, and this is for the vertical farm. So that first plot was the piercing correlation plots for the greenhouse. Uh, the trends for the vertical farm were slightly different. We saw actually there was more positive correlations um, between the solution and the tissue, especially looking at the micronutrients. And then actually for the calcium, we didn't see that kind of negative inhibitory effect, which was kind of an interesting finding. Um, we thought as we looked into the gas exchange data, we thought this could be due to that kind of increased airflow that we provide um, to the vertical farm plants that would increase transpiration and increase that translocation of calcium. And then as we looked at the gas exchange data, we also saw that plants on the vertical farm were significantly transpiring more uh, water. So that could be a potential explanation of why we see that kind of disparity of results between the greenhouse and vertical farm. Uh, we also wanted to look at different um, how ratios, as I mentioned, cations can affect um, the ratios of certain cations to each other can impact um, how how available particular nutrients are. So here we wanted to look at the concentration of calcium with respect or with of potassium with respect to calcium. And we wanted to see how that uh, ratio impacted fresh canopy biomass. As we can see here, it's a low to moderate relationship, but actually solutions within each PPFD level tended to have a negative relationship. So if your solution had a lower ratio of potassium to calcium, they tended to have um, actually a higher yield. Okay, and then moving on to the second chapter, which was looking at spinach. So again, we saw similar trends with our spinach. Um, looking at the greenhouse, uh, we saw significant differences in yield as we increased to 500 PPFD, but did not get additional gains in yield as we went to 700 PPFD. And then we almost saw the identical ten um, in the vertical farm. And actually, we didn't see any significant differences um, in the vertical farm in terms of the canopy biomass. We saw in some cases, so for 500 PPFD in the vertical farm, we had higher root biomass, but it didn't. the spinach did not seem to perform any higher in the vertical farm compared to the greenhouse. Uh, the results for the nutrient management strategies were a little bit more complicated as well. We didn't have a nice clean relationship where there was no difference. Actually, in the case of the greenhouse, we saw the nutrient management strategy in which we were draining and refilling actually had one of the highest yield results. But as we went into the vertical farm, we kind of almost saw an inverse relationship where the drain and refill treatment had one of the lowest uh, yield associated with it. So it was a bit of a mixed bag, not as clear results um, for the canopy biomass data. But as we looked at the fertilizer results, it's similar to lettuce, where we're using you know, around 90% less fertilizer when comparing to the drain and refill. And then as we compare among the strategies that don't drain and refill, again, we see the EC-based strategy used most, while uh, strategies like the water use efficiency and lab-based refill are using uh, far less. Uh, the pH amendments were a little bit different as well. Uh, it seemed like the spinach didn't have a preference for taking up as much cations it's possible that they more had a preference for nitrate nitrogen because I tended to uh, adjust the pH down more often. Um, and then you can see here the EC-based treatment, we actually had the most amendments and that's because as we were refilling this and adding stock solution, one of our stock solutions tended to raise the pH and then the pH of the solution was already going up in spinach. So for that particular treatment, we actually ended up amending the pH more. Again, we did quantify the chlorosis and tip burn. Um, we saw similar trends where higher light intensity tended to induce higher um, rates of chlorosis and tip burn. Uh, but interestingly, as we looked at those rates among the nutrient management strategies, again, we didn't see a significant difference in their prevalence. So for the pigmentation of the leaves, we saw similar trends to what we saw in lettuce, where we didn't see any significant differences among the nutrient management strategies. We actually did see a difference in the, um, the pigment content when comparing the greenhouse to the vertical farm. 
You can see in the vertical farm, both for anthocyanin and chlorophyll, we have significantly higher amounts of each of those pigments. So again, we're looking at the final solution concentration. Um, here we saw similar trends where EP based and full strength tended to accumulate more nutrients in solution. And then similar trend was seen in the vertical farm where those particular treatments tended to accumulate more while the others tend to be more depleted than our initials. Uh, results were a little bit different for spinach. It seemed like it had different preferences for what elements it would accumulate. You'll notice that magnesium tended to accumulate much higher than the prescribed uh, sufficiency ranges, as well as phosphorus, and even potassium is a little bit high. But again, we saw that our calcium uh, concentration in the tissue tended to be low across all the nutrient management strategies. And one large difference here is that we didn't see iron necessarily going much higher than the sufficiency ranges, but copper and particularly zinc tended to hyperaccumulate. You can see we're almost three times out of the sufficiency range for zinc. So as to be expected, there's differences between crops and a lot of times cultivars. So um, it's never a one size fits all with having a nutrient composition across different species. And, excuse me, then there's um... Those ranges are specific for the uh, spinach and, you know, for the crop? Yeah, okay. yeah. So for these ranges, we use the same sufficiency range for lettuce and spinach, because if you look at the literature there, there's subtle differences, but just for the ease of kind of processing the data, we use the same targets and sufficiency ranges. But there are some subtle differences, but it, we didn't use them for the for these plots. That is from Harry Mills, and even though it was published in 2015, we're talking about it, so it's probably data collected many years before. So I, I right. think that is a, a new edition of the manual that we have, so. Yeah, because they have ranges that are specific to hydroponically growing leafy greens, and that's that's what we use for those. Um, yeah, so moving on, looking at for the Pearson correlation again, uh, here we saw a pretty distinct trend compared to the lettuce in that having higher concentrations of each of the elements had more antagonistic effects. So having high amounts of each fertilizer and solution at the end of the experiment tended to have um, negative correlations with what would be in the tissue at the end of the experiment. So it's again highlighting those differences between growing different crops and how they behave um, under these different conditions. Again, we looked at the potassium to calcium ratio. We saw a similar trend um, where there was a moderate relationship between having a lower potassium to calcium ratio and higher yields. So that's just highlighting the fact that it's not, it seems to be the case that um, oftentimes it's not just the absolute amount of one fertilizer, but it's relationship to others. So this is kind of a point as we go forward in research and analyze the data, it'll be interesting to look at these different ratios and how they're impacting um, within these nutrient management strategies to help us kind of improve upon them. Uh, so one interesting thing to note, as I broke this data between the greenhouse and the vertical farm, you can see in, for the greenhouse data, there was no real relationship for the potassium to calcium ratio, but in the vertical farm, it was strong. So on average, it was about 0.7. So that one's kind of interesting. And that kind of highlights the fact that, you know, it's not only the cultivar, but also if you're growing under high CO2, you're modifying airflow. These can also impact how your plants are going to perform uh, under those different sets of conditions. So to conclude, um, these nutrient management strategies that don't drain and refill are using 90% less water, 91% less fertilizer. And then among the treatments that are not um, draining and refilling, using half strength water use efficiency or the lab-based techniques, you're able to use on average 86% less fertilizer. And this is exciting because even if you don't have, you know, the funds to do some of these more advanced techniques, even refilling with half strength solution is a, a good way to uh, manage your composition of solution. Um, nutrient management strategies did not significantly impact the health of lettuce in the vertical farm and greenhouse or the spinach in the vertical farm. But as we saw, the spinach grown in the greenhouse, we did see some impacts on yield based on the nutrient management strategy. Uh, and then as we looked at light intensity, it did not affect the performance of the different nutrient management strategies. But as I mentioned, it did change the rates of depletion and how often you're having to do things like pH amendments. So um, if you're growing in a condition where you have high plant density, these strategies would work, but you may have to like increase the cadence because a lot of these events are happening more quickly. So that's just something to note about light intensity. And then as we compared between the greenhouse and the vertical farm, we saw that the trends are similar um, on how the different strategies performed. But again, we saw those kind of odd results in the spinach grown in the greenhouse. So that warrants 
uh, for the research. So I want to acknowledge everyone in the lab. I know we had to do a lot of work building these different systems. So even before we could get through to the research, I mean, I only got some of these results back like a week and a half ago. So it's been, it's been a long journey getting everything set up. And I think everyone had a hand in building the vertical farm, helping install lights, do all this stuff. So it was a huge team effort. Um, also I want to thank the members of uh, Dr. Mark's lab. And also, honestly, if we didn't, if Dr. Mark hadn't laid the groundwork, I don't think we'd have a controlled environment ag lab here in Georgia. So I think his contributions will go on for you know generations. So, and everything he established in the lab and kind of his protocols of how to program data loggers, it made my life easier as well. So had a huge impact on my success in designing these experiments. Um, also, thank you to the, our sponsors who, you know, not sponsors, our corporate um, partners. Partners, that's a good word, uh, for helping us with our fertilizer and installing our lights that made the lighting research possible. And with that, I will open it up to any questions. I've got one. Um, so, you know, getting to the problem of, you know, dump and refill. Yeah. Um, you know, it's recommended to do that. That's the, you know, most, maybe the, one of the most common, you know, strategies. Have you ever heard of any type of reclamation program that may be able to utilize or recycle those nutrients that are getting dumped? Like, would they be able to go and say, pick up someone's solution, take it somewhere, evaporate the water, test the composition of the, you know, what's left, and then reutilize it somewhere else. I don't know anything that specific. I know people, they can use that runoff in like forming of wetlands and stuff like that. So like ecological sinks, I've heard people using the solutions for those type of applications, but I haven't heard anything as specific as that, but that was something I was kind of interested in too. Even I know we talked about, um, if we could use that exhausted solution in like algae growth, because there's a lot of kind of controlled environment ag that's associated with growing algae. So that was kind of initial kind of thought path we went down, but it was a whole different <laughs> animal. It's like use um, vegetable oil, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a good, because I think no matter what, you're still going to have um, a moderate amount of these elements in solution. But if you can reduce that by, you know, 99% and not have any impact on your quality, it makes sense for the grower as well and for you know ecosystems to reduce it. But I think, yeah, there should be some strategy beyond that to kind of curtail the amount that gets into the water base. So, so Matt, to your point, for example, in places like Brazil, where farms, you know, are, um, I would say businesses that have hydroponics and they have fuel production and sometimes they have animal production too. So they tend to accumulate those in larger tanks and they just fertigate fuel crops mm -hmm. with those solutions because they are nutrient rich. Yeah. So uh, it's very common practice. So we don't have a lot of these in the States uh, yeah. <laughs> just because the nature of our operations, but that's feasible. Yeah, I kind of wonder how, how prevalent actual dump you know, it's a big company is actually dumping a mass amount of like fertilizer solution, like into a waterway. I want to know, like, it'd be yeah, he should get it. It's traveled. Yeah, well, I mean, based on that, the census, and then when I was working in industry, like they were having issues with their nutrients and with pathogens, and it became like very frequent. Like, and they had big reservoirs they were draining. And I mean, if you're comparing it to field-based agriculture, that's still the main contributor. So I don't know the comparison of what that would be. But I think as you're growing these crops like around city centers, I think you also have the additional impact of like how it's impacting water quality for people drinking it. Because there's less sinks that are gonna be immediately available. So if you're kind of putting that into the waterways, it could impact, you know, ecology downstream or locally with like some of the communities. And I guess if there's toxic algal blooms that can, or harmful algal blooms, I guess is the correct term. So I think that's another part to consider as well. I got one. Yeah, sure. It seemed like your um, your tissue nutrient concentrations for calcium for both crops were low. Yeah. Do you think that was an airflow issue? 
Um, like, do you think the airflow in the vertical farm was insufficient or maybe not insufficient, but below optimum or yeah, in well, the greenhouse too? I mean, well, that's a good segue for Parker because he's going to be talking <laughs> about that. He used the same airflow on the same solution, so mm -hmm. he might be able to give more insight on that. Sure. Um, I think, I mean, as we looked at that kind of Pearson correlation, it seemed like having more airflow did mitigate some of that negative correlation between high solution and low amounts in the tissue. But I think it comes back to those ratios of it's very specific to your crop and cultivar, like keeping those balanced throughout the trial, it would require, you know, monitoring those ratios over time. And I think that could be a potential solution. Like even if a grower can't have all the different elements it's monitoring, if we find that like potassium to calcium ratio is one that's very sensitive to impact yield, you could have those two sensors and you kind of monitor those as your target point. So I think it's more, the more I'm looking at the data and reading more about it, I think a lot of it's due to like these antagonisms that happen, not the, but airflow definitely does impact it. Like I said, it yeah. awesome. Just calcium. Yeah, yeah. I would just, it'd be yeah. interesting to look at like an experiment where you look at the strength of those, where you have all these different treatments and see which one impacts it the most. Um, so that would be interesting because, yeah, it's kind of tough to parse out all the factors because they're all linked, you know. I think you used one uh, meter per second, right, on vertical farm tip? The and airflow. Yeah, yeah, the airflow is relatively yeah. high. In fact, there was no statistical difference between 1 and 1 1.3. I would say that it's really related to the low uh, mobility of calcium. Yeah. Stuff. That is the major issue yeah. that we face. Yeah. Chris, perhaps you want to uh, click on participants and check online if we have any questions before we proceed, uh, you know, with questions here. Sure. Yeah. Is there any questions online? All right. Seems like we don't have questions there. So can I ask you a question? Yes. So uh, you started your program. Really interested in uh, knowing more about plant nutrition. In uh, your body of work is highlighting how much you've done to accomplish that. And now I wonder. So, do you think you kind of, you know, unveil all the challenges of plant nutrition? If not, so what would you do next if you were to continue this? Because the word never ends, right? Yeah. No, Assuming that's, you were not good. going to a PhD and you were going to, <laughs> you know, continue uh, at uh, the University of Minnesota, but you do something different. So what would you recommend as the next steps? Yeah, I mean, I think I would go back to looking at those, um, looking at the ratios of nutrients, because even if it's not mobile, I think you can exacerbate, like for calcium, for example, you can exacerbate that if you have higher amounts of potassium. So I think looking at experiments where we look at different balances and looking at how that changes over time, um, and then potentially adding things like airflow and kind of understanding how those <laughs> impact and how those can impact you, I think that would be kind of an interesting line of research. And as I was looking at the results, I was like, ah, oh, it'd be great if someone did this, <laughs> have an answer. But I think, yeah. <laughs> I think looking at those kind of real-time changes in solution would be would be interesting to track over time. And then kind of trying to establish a way to like have that be applicable so growers can somewhat easily implement a system like that without having all of this, you know, individual ion sensing and testing their tissue all the time. So it's kind of broad, but that's the direction I would head in, I think. You also found noticeable differences between the environments, right? So greenhouse versus vertical farm. So do you have a preference concerning a system <laughs> to recommend? I wonder. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's not uh it's not objective at all, but it's more to do with how it's so difficult to work in the vertical farm just because it's tight quarters, you're having to go up levels. So like and once I finished those experiments and could work in the greenhouse where you can just like walk like and, and do normal stuff and not bump your head on everything and spill stuff and drop stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> this is just personal preference, but yeah, I working in the vertical farm and Parker can attest to that. It's pretty challenging. It's, it's personal, just, but it's part of, uh, think about people that have to work in those environments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, day in, oh, day yeah. out. So I mean, it makes a big difference on, on your mental 
Yeah, <laughs> the artificial environment and the lights, yeah, you know, and exactly. all that. Yeah, we were happening outside. And... But I guess I guess to kind of counter that point, it was fun like setting up all the feedback because we like built our own humidifier, we built the CO two injection system, kind of figuring out all this logic to control things like tightly. I think that kind of exercise is really valuable too because you understand you can't necessarily just understand the plants. You have to understand how to set up these environments so you know what the plants are experiencing. So I think that, especially in controlled environment ag, it's a really valuable skill set because it's so overlapping. So I think I learned more in the vertical farm, but it came at a cost. So. <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any, any other questions, people online? Give them another shot. Um, hey, Chris, um, Mel Melanie Yelton here. Um, hi, nice work. Very, very nice work. I was just looking, I was just thinking about your conclusions that I was just wondering then if, if, a, if you went out into the world as a consultant and a farmer was asking you, like, what would be the growing strategy you recommend? How, how in plain terms would you just tell them what, what to do? Is that specific to like what kind of nutrient management strategy I would recommend? Well, nutrient and light, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a good question, but it it's challenging because I think a lot of it depends. Because um, just being at that controlled environment ag workshop recently, it's yeah. just interesting to look at how different companies are approaching their business model. So I think from a plant perspective, you could have a you know an explanation or like plain terms you could give them, but I think it also has to tie in with their business model and like what their labor costs are and what crops they're growing um, and, and their access to capital and stuff like that. So I think it'd be a much more, I mean, you're probably aware of this doing your consulting. I think it's much more challenging to give a plain answer because you can talk <laughs> about what, what makes sense for the plants. But once you kind of throw in how that interacts with like a farm's net profit, it becomes a completely different question. So I think you have to incorporate all the things together, which I'm sure you know is not not an easy thing to do. So yeah, I don't know. That's kind of a broad answer, but that's I think you'd have to know a lot of those assumptions before you could give a good recommendation. Okay, here right. we go. Right. Lettuce. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Lettuce, cheapest possible. <laughs> um, and uh, what was the other thing? Highlight. So and that's not cheap. Either. Yeah, yeah. So basically, the cheapest amount of made, capital. Made yeah, and lettuce and um, half strength. Yeah, half strength. Half strength. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll just say growing a greenhouse with half strength because that's yeah. like you don't have to have any specific technology to do that. Anybody can set it up that way. Mm -hmm. You don't have to pay for the lighting. Yeah, so I think in that sense, like greenhouse production makes a lot of sense. Um, but. Yeah, I think you also have to kind of know your markets and what crops to grow. I don't know. It's a broad question. It's hard to get put on the spot for <laughs> a particular. Uh, she should have been more specific. <laughs> no, it's a good question, but it's like, I think it's really challenging to answer those questions without having the specifics of a given. It's like if you're a doctor and you're trying to, you can't be like, well, for you, you know, an apple a day is fine. It's like. There's so many nuances to all the different setups. So location, cost of resources. Oh yeah, different. yeah. There's like infinite things to consider. So yeah. I'm gonna dodge that question and say I don't know. I guess. <laughs> no, it's it. complicated. It takes it's you have to take a lot of things into account. Yeah. yeah. Well, like, my favorite yeah. plant response is like when people ask questions, they're like, "Oh, it's just cultivar specific." <laughs> yeah. Like the easiest way to like yeah. sidestep any question. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So Melanie, since you're uh, in the line, I would like to uh, bring something up. Uh, so one of the reasons why we increase the light levels to 700 micromoles and why we tested the two environments was because of you. So uh, I appreciate very much that it really gave us uh, very positive insights, even though uh, it was a lot of work for Chris. Uh, so we do need to uh, discuss how we are going to acknowledge uh, Melanie there because she was with Plenty at the time, but now with Grow Big Consultants. So I think we need to put 
you know, an acknowledgement for her over there. No, well, I, I thought about it as I was going through my acknowledgement slides. I've forgotten the time, but yeah, I met with her <laughs> and Eli as we were designing the experiment and we talked about, yeah, what type of approach would make sense that would be applicable to industry because that was another one of the challenges with this type of research is making it applicable to what growers are doing because it's kind of a secretive industry and people don't like to talk about how they're doing things. There's a lot of IP concerns, so... I think we were able to find uh, a set of experiments that were broadly applicable to a lot of different stakeholders. So yeah, late acknowledgement, sorry, Melanie, and to Eli. But Eli no worries, helped. no worries at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we did it at the end, so that's, I hope that makes <laughs> up for it, Melanie. <laughs> yeah, no, just glad to help, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Melanie. Thank you very much, uh, everyone that uh, joined us over Zoom. Thank you for being here uh, with us uh, in person. So a big round of applause to you, Chris. Yeah, congratulations. Wonderful. So 